Persona 4 Golden has always been somewhat restricted since for the longest time it was only available on the PlayStation Vita. I was actually pretty close to getting myself a PlayStation TV for pretty much only this game. Luckily though, it did finally get released on Steam in 2020 and now we can all enjoy its glory on PC. I wanted my newest challenge run to be about a Persona game. At first, I wanted to do something related to Persona 5 or P5 Royal, but looking up on YouTube, there's already been tons of challenges of all different kinds, so I took a step back in the series and looked at Persona 4 Golden. Today, we will try and see if we can beat Persona 4 Golden, but without using any skills at all. Now what does that mean? Basically, the entire skill section will be banned both in and outside of battle. This pretty much only leaves us with the attack, guard, persona and item command. Now, before we start, let's quickly go through the rules of this challenge. First of all, usage of skills is not allowed. Like I just mentioned, all skills are banned both in and outside of battle unless it is required in order to advance the story. No new game plus. New game plus, as always, kinda defeats the purpose of this challenge, so we start off with a fresh file. The true golden ending must be achieved. The goal is to go through the entire game's content, meaning we will also go through the optional dungeon with Marie, as well as the actual final dungeon with Izanami at the end. Difficulty is going to be hard. There is no difference in actual battle difficulty between hard and very hard, with the only difference being less experience and money, plus the option to retry the dungeon floor if you game over. For the sake of not wanting to grind forever, we're going with hard here. Note, there will be one exception to this rule, but I'll get to that in just a moment. Also, if you are curious about the entire playthrough, I linked the playlist of my VOD channel in the info cards as well in the description below the video. And last but not least, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and also hit the bell. Feel free to check out my Twitch as well at twitch.tv slash ragnaralvar. All the live streams of challenge runs, speed runs, or just casual playthroughs will be on there and also follow me on Twitter at ragnar.alvar. Now with that being out of the way, let's get going. We start the game, go through the opening cutscene and get to name our main character with the very well fitting name of Mike Tyson, because we're going to needlessly hit enemies over the head over and over again. We meet Dojima and Nanako, briefly run into Marie before meeting the gas station attendee who is totally not Izanami in disguise. After a pandemic free handshake, our fate is already sealed and we continue on. Now, there isn't really anything we can do the first couple of days since it's mostly storyline related stuff, so we'll skip forward to April the 15th. Before jumping into the TV, Yosuke gives us three medicines and at this point it's starting to get interesting. This segment consists of two encounters, first against two slipping Hablaries and Shadow Yosuke right afterwards. Both enemies would be weak to seal, unfortunately we're not allowed to use that so all we can do is attack. Since the incoming damage at this point is quite high, we already need to throw the first medicine in the tutorial battle already, since even with a random occasional critical hit, we can't do enough damage in time to avoid that. This leaves us at two medicines for Shadow Yosuke, and here's the next problem. The game definitely expects you to make use of seal to get two attacks each turn, but since we're not allowed to use that, the damage output is a lot lower than it should be. At the same time, we regularly have to guard his charged attacks as well as throw medicines to keep main character alive. The two medicines we have left over are barely enough to push Shadow Yosuke past 50% of his health, but it's nowhere near enough to get through the entire fight. After trying this segment a couple of times, I was curious if three medicines would be enough for Shadow Yosuke. So I went through the first fight using Seo just to see if this is even possible at all. Unfortunately, even having all three medicines in possession, you're still quite a bit off from actually finishing the fight. Now, since the first couple of days were exclusively cutscene related things, there wasn't any chance to get additional items or anything. Both the weapon merchant as well as the item shop are still closed and there is nothing you can do to gain additional healing items before this part. I did talk about one exception to the game's difficulty while going through the rules just before, and this is already the one. This seems to be straight up impossible and hard, so for this one segment, we're going to lower the difficulty to normal. 
On normal, you can get through the first battle without using a medicine, so we go into Shadow Yosuke with all healing items still in possession. Shadow Yosuke was a lot more manageable on normal as well. The incoming damage was quite a bit lower, while our damage was much higher as well. With only two medicines used, we can continue this playthrough and set the difficulty back to hard again. We jump forward two days to April the 17th, where we get into the Dara's weapon shop for the first time. We use most of our money to buy a weapon for both main character as well as Yosuke. Technically, we could also buy a couple of medicines at the item shop, but those are rather expensive and starting from now on, we can also farm healing items in dungeons, so for now, we skip that part. Once we are done with that, we are back into the TV to save Yukiko and also Chie. As long as the fight with Chie is not done yet, floor 1 of the castle has a fixed layout. We use that to our advantage to grind a couple of chests in order to get some life stones and also some peach seeds to have some more healing items. At the same time, we're trying to grind a couple of enemies to get our levels up in order to get through the Shadow Chia fight as well as grab the first couple of personas. One specific persona I want to mention here is Slime, which learns Resist Physical at level 7. Since we're not allowed to actively use any skills, the only useful thing throughout this challenge are going to be passive skills. Having access to Resist Physical this early in the game is really good since you get to carry it over when fusing Slime into other things. This entire grinding session lasted for almost two hours before I felt like ready that we could continue on. Now, I might have been just slightly deceived by the damage of the random encounters because I actually grinded the party up all the way to level 10 before going into the Shadow Chia fights. Shadow Chia resists physical as well, so the damage done isn't necessarily high. Since we grinded up so much though, Chia herself practically did no damage to the party at all. In fact, I didn't even have to use a single healing item in the entire fight before she went down. After the battle is over, we leave the TV world, Chia joins the party, we get our new boots, as well as quite a few elemental damaging items. Those do a fixed 50 damage, so they are literally perfect for grinding golden hands. The golden hands in the castle have 150 HP, so 3 items can guarantee a kill here. The firecrackers and ice cubes are especially important since we're going to use those on the mid dungeon boss as well as on Shadow Yukiko herself. The next day, we are back into the TV to finish what we started off the day before. GH wins the party on level 4, so she is just slightly behind the rest of the party. We make our way to floor 5, where the mid dungeon boss is already waiting. Luckily, this one is weak to fire, so by throwing a firecracker and following it with an all-out attack, we can already do some pretty good damage on turn 1. After that, the boss puts up a firewall, so unfortunately the all-out attack is out of the window. But since the items do a fixed damage, it is still more powerful than just using regular attacks. The power charged attacks hurt quite a bit, but since they're only single target, we can just use a revival beat and without any further issues, the enemy is down and we continue on. Before we go up any further though, we still need a couple of levels and this is the point where we are going to manipulate things in our favor. As you might know, dungeon floors are randomized unless it is a floor where a story related cutscene or boss fight happens. We use those fixed floors to our advantage to get guaranteed golden hand encounters. By starting up the game and waiting a specific time on the intro screen before loading up the save file, we can manipulate the first enemy to spawn on a fixed floor to be a golden hand. This mechanic is mainly used in speedruns for the sake of fast leveling. In our scenario, we use it to make the grind a bit faster and since it's also safer to grind on golden hands than on regular enemies, especially on higher floors. We repeat that process a couple of times until main character is level 15 before advancing the castle all the way to the final floor. Before entering the boss battle though, we go back into the velvet room to fuse ourselves a Barif. Barif has decent stats, but what's even more important is null fire. That combined with resist physical we can transfer from slime makes for a perfect tank in the upcoming boss fight. There are some other options with null fire as well, but they usually have rather low strength and or endurance, so Barif kinda turned out to be the best option here. With that set up, we're off to the top floor and the first actual boss fight of the game. Now, turn 1 was very similar to the mid dungeon boss from earlier. 
we throw an ice cube and follow it up with an all-out attack. After she puts up white wall, we continue with normal attacks since the damage isn't actually too far off compared to the items. Luckily in the beginning, Yukiko always has a turn set up before doing burn to ashes, so we just guard with Chie. Yosuke is also taking quite a bit of damage here, so we will guard with both of them. Our main character, luckily, is immune to fire, thanks to Berif. After a couple of turns, Yukiko summons the Charming Prince. Luckily, he's weak to electricity, so once again we can make use of our items. First get down Yukiko with an ice cube, then throw a ball lightning on the prince, and go for another all-out attack. You don't actually need to beat Prince Charming, since he automatically runs away once you push Shadow Yukiko past a certain HP threshold. Luckily, a turn full of items and all-out attacks was enough for that, and we can continue slashing onto Yukiko. Towards the end of the fight, she uses Terra Voice and basically insta-kills Yosuke, which isn't really a big problem at all, since we have more than enough revival beats. A few more turns later, Shadow Yukiko is down, Yukiko is saved, and we're finished with the first dungeon of the game. Now that we have a couple of days off until the story continues, we're starting off the first couple of social links. We join the soccer club, as well as the drama club, and hang out with Yosuke and Marie. We also buy a couple of books and take the first side jobs. This was also the first time I noticed the disadvantage of only grinding golden hands during the dungeon crawling section, since I never really grinded any random enemies, I barely got any loot to sell to the Adara, so there aren't going to be any equipment upgrades for me before going into the next dungeon. Also, unfortunately, I never got any gems in the castle, so I couldn't interact with the hostess, which would have gotten me the hook for the fishing rod, plus the shop to exchange gems for useful weapons. I could have gone back since I still had a save file from before clearing the castle, or just spend an additional day in the TV, but I decided to just continue further on and hope for the best. We also grabbed the first couple of quests on the way for the next dungeon section of the game. Unfortunately, at this point, my stream bugged out completely, also destroying the local recording in the process, so the last few parts of the free time unfortunately are missing. Luckily, nothing really important happened during that time frame, so we're going to continue on right before going back into the TV to save Kanji. Before entering the bathhouse, we go back to the liquor store where we fought Shadow Yosuke. We grab a quest item there, as well as a new weapon for him. Since we didn't get a lot of loot in the castle and therefore couldn't buy any new weapons, Yosuke at this point is pretty much the only party member with a good weapon. Going into the bathhouse, literally the first enemy we run into is a set of two golden hands. Luckily, I bought more items before coming in here. Those enemies already have 300 HP, so we need a total of 6 items to beat a single one of them. Even with that experience boost though, I am still underleveled and progressing through the bathhouse is rather slow since everything still hits rather hard and I'm not doing a whole lot of damage with just regular attacks. There are barely any encounters we can get through without problems, so we'd run into the same issue as last time where the lack of loot from battle directly results in a lack of upgrade options when it comes to equipment. There was also another golden hand encounter on my way, but this time it summoned an iron dice which exploded and pretty much wiped everybody but main character. Because of that, he got all the experience from that fight and suddenly was like 6 levels ahead of everybody else. Once we hit floor 4, I decided to use a go home and go back to the castle. The quests we have gotten during the free time were a good reason to revisit the castle and grind there for a little while for both items and experience. The highest floor in the castle actually has pretty good chest items. Obviously we always want lifestones, but there are a couple of other real useful items there. Among them are diamond shields, which are basically the only way to boost the party's defense, and Magic Mirror, which have the same effect as the Makarakarn spell, basically reflecting a spell back at the enemy. Even more useful at this point though is the Smart Bomb, something I completely forgot about. Smart Bombs deal a fixed 100 AoE damage, meaning that with 3 Smart Bombs, we can wipe a full encounter of Golden Hands in the bathhouse within a single turn. Once we were done with that, main character was already level 31, with the rest of the party being level 28. 
I've also gotten over 40 life stones as well as 13 smart bombs so at this point the bathhouse should be much more doable than before. Before we go back though we give the optional boss on the top floor a shot. Unfortunately he's not weak to any elemental damage so we can't go for item shenanigans here. The single target attacks did a lot of damage but were manageable for the most part. Once he threw out Rampage though it was pretty much over. Even at this party level it still does way too much damage. Considering the only thing we're getting here is a weapon for Yukiko, a character we will bench forever once we get Kanji anyways, it's really not worth the effort. The courage increase would be pretty nice but we'll do without it as well. Even though we already made it up to floor 4 in the bathhouse already, I still decided to start from floor 1 again since we barely defeated any enemies on the first visit so I wanted to make sure to get some good loot in here as well. Once we hit floor 7 we are about to fight the mid dungeon boss. Before we do that though, there will be a bit more gold enhanced manipulation since we are on a fixed floor again. At this point we probably don't need to grind that much since we're mostly good on levels. But a couple more levels and especially more money never hurts, right? So again, we do the manipulation thing, spawn a set of 3 golden hands and wipe them within a single turn thanks to the smart bombs. Even though we could technically force up to 5 encounters with the amount of smart bombs we got, we continue on after 3 since I wanted to have a couple of them for the boss fight against Shadow Kanji, but more on that in just a bit. The mid dungeon boss, who by the way totally is not supposed to be Hulk Hogan at all, isn't really an issue. He buffs for 3 turns and then only goes for a single target attack. Since that is all he does, we can conveniently auto the fight while throwing a revival beat every time he knocks somebody out until we're done with it. There isn't really anything worth mentioning for the next couple of floors up until we are all the way at the top. Before we fight Shadow Kanji, we go back into the Velvet Room one more time. In here, we fuse a Satanta. This one not only has nice stats, but is also immune to electricity which is going to be pretty useful against Kanji. It also learns Counter Strike on level 36. Unfortunately this skill does not stack with the regular counter skill but it is still a nice upgrade considering we only have access to a couple of passive skills at this point. With that we are off to the second boss of the game with an average party level of 33. Now the boss itself Shadow Kanji has two companions with him. Nice guy is pretty much only buffing the others while tough guy is attacking the party with Kanji. Due to the buffs that Nice Guy would be throwing out, we need to take care of him first. Luckily, he only has 800 HP as well as a weakness to ice, so once again we're using items to our advantage here. Tough Guy has a weakness to fire and can also become dizzy when you hit the weakness twice in a turn, which is very useful since Nice Guy will always prioritize getting him up again with Repatra, preventing him from doing any other buffs in the process. We basically knock the two guys out using elemental items and follow it up with the remaining smart bombs since those do 100 AoE damage which is way more than anything else we have at our disposal at this point. Once the nice guy is out we start to focus on shadow kanji. Tough guy is annoying but he can't be kept dizzy with firecrackers. Since he also has rather high HP we're not going to actually defeat him but focus our damage towards Kanji. The biggest issue with Kanji are his AoE electricity attacks. Since Yosuke is weak to those he takes quite some damage and it also gives Kanji another turn. Luckily I still had a few value medicines over from before the castle so those are going to be pretty helpful here. Lifestones are also a good means of healing even though they're only single target. Since we grinded quite a few of those we can use them very freely. Every turn where main character gets attacked basically counts as a free turn since not only he blocks electricity, he also has resist physical as well as really high defense from an armor we found earlier so he barely takes any damage at all. With that we whittle our way through the fight slowly until Kanji is done for good. Kanji is rescued and the second dungeon is already completed. The following day we complete all the side quests we have gotten and also sell all the loot from the dungeon. 
We will not buy any new equipment yet, as there are a couple of opportunities to get equipment other ways before we reach the next dungeon section of the game. Also, we finally get the hook for the rod from the hostess, after going in with a couple of gems in our possession. There are some decent weapons here, but most of them require gems that we don't have at this point. With lots of free time on our hands, we go back, take a couple of new jobs, and start expanding our social links. We meet Eri, further enhance our bond with Adachi, Nanako, and Tuchima, and we also build a vegetable garden. Great vegetables. At this point, we can't buy vegetables anymore, but only seeds to grow them ourselves. Unfortunately, the seeds available at the start aren't really that useful in this kind of setup, but that is going to change later on. Since we got the job at the pub, Teddy Duchima finally lets us go outside during nighttime. There are actually a couple of things worth mentioning during this part. Not only are we back to enhance our social links further, we can also go fishing now since we finally got the rod. We also get access to the bug catching net, so we can continue feeding the fish at the pub, as well as get better bait for the fish. From this point on, TV Tanaka for Sunday shopping is also available, where we already get new boots for Chia to kick with. Daddy Dochima is nice enough to let us have his old motorcycle, so we can go to Okina once we rode it three times. Okina has two interesting things for this playthrough. First of all, we get access to the cinema where we can watch movies with our party members. This not only makes them level up, but they also gain additional stats because of that. The second useful thing here is the cafe, where we can extract skill cards out of our personas. At this point, we don't have anything useful yet, but that is going to change throughout the game, so this is definitely a good option to have available. Another thing we do is complete the quest for Cabbage for the woman at Jeunesse. The reason I mention this quest specifically is that we get two good weapons out of it. First of all, we get the sharp shovel for completing it, which is a good weapon for main character that also comes with auto Tarukasha. We do have that skill on our persona at the moment as well, but it's never bad to have that. With the help of the shovel, we can go to the floodplain during nighttime and help the dog there dig out a bone. The bone is a really strong weapon for Yosuke, which also has a high critical chance. Before we can put those to use though, we still have a bit of free time to kill. Hanako smashes Yosuke's motorcycle, the girls try to poison us with food, and Yosuke tries to... Well, let's not talk about that. Dude, that's just wrong. We take our party members to the cinema for a free level up, as well as some extra stats, and also get a new weapon for Kanji at the pub, since he's pretty much the only one without a proper weapon at the moment. Shortly afterwards, Risei turns up and gets thrown into the TV. So, off into the next dungeon section we go. Or, actually, hang on a second. Since it's a rainy day, rainy brothers show up quite often. Unfortunately, those are immune to physical attacks though, so for the sake of killing them effectively, we need AoE items, which conveniently just showed up in the item shop a couple of days before. Luckily, I always have a separate save file for the dungeon segment, so we go back again and stack up on those items. Back in the TV world, we pay a revisit to the bathhouse before entering the new area, since we have gotten quite a couple of quests again. This also has the nice side effect that Kanji gains a couple of levels, since he only joined the party on level 25, while the others already were over 30. Once we got all the quest items and reached the top of the bathhouse, we teleport out and actually start off with the next dungeon, the strip club. This was also the time where I got my first skill upgrade during shuffle, something again I completely forgot about. This one changed my resist physical to a null physical, which was really nice. Being able to transform elemental resistances into null opens up a ton of possibilities for future fusions. Other than that, there isn't really a lot of stuff worth mentioning for the most part. The amount of shadows that null, repel or drain physical attacks is rather high, so we don't fight as many encounters as usually. Technically, I could kill them with items, but I wanted to save those for emergency situations, so most of the times I just escape from encounters like that. 
Once we hit level 42, we fuse our Satanta into Hanuman. Hanuman has good stats and also Null's Ice, which is going to be pretty important for the upcoming boss fight. He also learns Endure on level 47, which will be a nice safety net for future fights. On floor 7, we run into Armorous Snake, the next mid-dungeon boss. Luckily, it's weak to fire, so the combination of item plus all-out attack does good damage. Since the boss only uses physical attacks, it literally cannot damage main character, who now has null physical. A couple of turns later, the enemy is already done, and we continue on. The rest of the dungeon isn't really noteworthy, as we progress through it very smoothly for the most part. Before we're going to the boss fight though, we're going to go back into Yukiko's castle since we never beat the optional boss there. The weapon drop isn't really any interesting since it's for Yukiko, but beating the boss also greatly increases main character's courage, so we'll take that. Since the boss only uses physical attacks, this fight now is basically free. Once we're done, we're back into the strip club. At this point we have a level 46 Hanuman, which nulls physical, fire, and ice. It does have an electricity weakness unfortunately, but that shouldn't matter for the upcoming boss fight. With an average party level of 43, we are also on a higher level than usually at this point, even though we stopped manipulating golden hands to grind on. With that, we are off into the last part of the strip club and the next boss fight, or more like boss fights in this one. Part 1 against Shadow Rise isn't really worth mentioning for the most part. We throw a diamond shield to reduce the incoming damage, and then just attack until the scripted part of the battle starts. Once that happens, we heal up and just guard until the cutscene starts. Teddy goes Super Saiyan, his shadow goes nuts, and part 2 of the battle starts. Again, we start off with using a diamond shield to reduce the incoming damage. Teddy uses Morakunda relatively often. Luckily, we got a lot of diamond shields, so that's not a big issue. With the defense buff, the incoming damage is fairly manageable, and life stones often are enough to heal up. With the exception of Nullity Guidance, main character is pretty much immune to all of Teddy's attacks, so it's more like keeping the other party members alive than anything else. Teddy doing Ultra Charge basically gives us a free turn to attack or heal up, and with the guard on the second turn, the party doesn't take any damage at all. If you get unlucky, Nullity Guidance can DC your entire party. Luckily in this boss fight, he never used it on more than two party members in a row, so we can just use items to get everybody back in time. The counters on main character and Chi actually reflect back a decent amount of damage to Teddy. Regular attacks don't do that much, but it adds up over time, and eventually Teddy goes down, and we finish the strip club as well as gain two new party members in the process. Since our party is pretty much set at this point, Teddy is not going to see a lot of use, but Reese's passive skills are going to be quite useful throughout this playthrough. With everybody being rescued, we are back to enjoying our school life. We get all the quest rewards for the stuff that we have gotten and further enhance our social links. The main focus here again is on the main party, especially Kanji, whose social link is still quite behind compared to the other two. We also take Satanta to the cafe in Okina City for a skill card. Satanta has Automar Kukaja, which is really useful. Since this only works one time though, we bring the card to Marie to register it. Unfortunately, buying it costs 80,000, so we're not going to do that just yet. Once July hits, a new movie is shown in the cinema, so once again we take our party there for a free level up, as well as some extra stat upgrades. This one gives extra strength, endurance and agility, which are pretty much the most important stats in this challenge. After a while the fog lifts, nobody's shown on the midnight channel, Risei safe, but King Moron dies. I guess you can't rescue everybody. Teddy now also permanently joins the party as an active party member, and he becomes a real boy because of that. <sighs> Much better. We meet Naoto, see you into dungeons, get a new homeroom teacher, and learn that the police already arrested a suspect in the case of King Moron's murder. We also start the social link with Risei, whose passive skills are actually a rather big upgrade. 
They only happen randomly in battle, but when they do happen, they can be a pretty big help. A couple of days later, Mitsuo shows up on Midnight Channel and we're basically ready to dive into the next dungeon section of the game. Before doing that, we buy new weapons for Chia and Kanji and make a quick stop at the item shop to buy a couple of healing items as well as extra elemental items. Once we got all the clues we need together, we're off into the TV again. Just like the last few times, we actually start off in the previous dungeon and get all the necessary items to fulfill the quests we got in the meantime. This piece of extra grinding also makes for quite some experience, so it's practically double effective. We also went back to the Velvet Room in order to fuse Narasimha. This one learns Automataru Kaj on level 53, which also happens to be a skill card on this persona. Since we used the Tanta with Automara Kukasha to fuse it, this persona is perfect to use as a pre-buff during random encounters. Since it will get hard to transfer that many skills over on your main persona, this one is mostly used as a pre-buffing measure for now. The back and forth switching after every battle is annoying, but the buffs are really nice to have, especially while grinding random encounters. We will also use this persona to fuse a Kingo later on, which has Automasa Kukasha, the last remaining AoE auto buff skill. Eventually, we will get all those three skills on skill cards, but as you might remember from earlier, those cost 80,000 each when you buy them from Marie's, so they're not necessarily cheap or anything. The first few floors in the Void Quest aren't really worth mentioning for the most part. The enemies in here are way easier to farm compared to the strip club since barely anything resists physical attacks and with the auto skills we also do much better damage as well. Before fighting the mid dungeon boss on floor 7, we use a go home and make another trip to the velvet room. Since main character just hit level 53, we can now perform the first multi-fusion and get ourselves a Tamlin. This one is a very good option for a couple of reasons. First of all, Tamlin is very much physical oriented and has the stats we are looking for. It has no elemental weakness and one of the needed personas here is the Narasimha we have used earlier. Thanks to that, we can transfer over the Automa skills as well as a lot of other passives like Null Physical and Null Fire. Since it also has high counter as well as enduring soul on level 59 and the fusion forecast also grants growth too as a bonus we pretty much got all the skills here we got on Hanuman and also the Automa skills and no elemental weakness. So all around a perfect upgrade compared to Hanuman who did serve us pretty well up until this point. Back into the dungeon we're up against the mid dungeon boss with a killing hand. The boss doesn't really do much other than summoning almighty hands or use deathbound. It is important though to get rid of the Almighty Hand quickly since it likes to use the Arama to heal the boss. Luckily, it's weak to ice, so by throwing a couple of dry ice, we're done with both hands rather quickly. The rest of the dungeon, again, wasn't really noteworthy for the most part. Once we reach the top, we leave the dungeon and actually go back to the previous two areas since we never beat the optional boss there. As I said earlier, Beating those isn't really worth it for the items, but we do get a big courage boost which is rather nice and since both bosses use physical attacks only, they literally can't damage main character. Before we fight Shadow Mitsuo though, there is still something else we need to do. This is also where the most annoying part of this segment started. I wanted to grind Magatamas from chests. Those do a fixed 150 damage to a single target, which is going to be very important for the upcoming boss fight, but more once we get there. A quick google search showed that floor 5 and 6 in the void quest are indeed the best floor to farm those. Now let me just say that if that information is actually correct, I don't even want to know what the regular drop chance is. Initially I wanted to collect a total of 20 magatamas but after roughly two and a half hours of running between those two floors collecting chests, I only found like 12 of those, which put me at a total of 17 once I stopped. So I went back to the final floor. Towards the end of this item grind, I actually stopped fighting regular shadows to not waste even more time. By this time, the party already reached level 62, which is way higher than what you normally are at this point of the game. After that, we visit the Velvet Room one more time to fuse a Kingo. 
King Yu, as mentioned earlier, has Automa's Uku as a skill card, which is the last remaining Automa skill that is still missing at this point. Once we got that out of the way, we are finally ready to fight Shadow Mitsuo. Now, phase 1 of this fight really isn't anything special. The robot only uses attack or item. Both are single target and don't do that much damage. The exhaustion effect isn't a big deal here since we don't need the SP anyways. Due to the Automa skills, we do good damage the first couple of turns and the robot form is quickly taken care of. Once we get to the baby form, the Magatamas we grinded earlier come into play. Baby Mitsuo is going to try to rebuild the robot and in order to prevent that from happening, you need to deal a certain amount of damage to him and Tam. The Magatamas do a fixed 150 damage, which is way more than we do with our regular attacks, so this perfectly works in our favor. Throwing a Magatama with each party member results in a total of 600 damage per turn, which is enough to stop the rebuilding process. This worked out perfectly the first two times. The third time, however, for reasons unbeknownst to myself, 600 damage don't seem to be enough and since he fully rebuilds the robot in two turns, we cannot prevent him this time and got to go through the robot phase one more time. This is a slight problem because when he actually rebuilds the robot, he also gets access to the spell command, which is a rather strong AoE almighty attack. Luckily with diamond shields, we can boost our defense. This still doesn't make it any easier, but the incoming damage is much more manageable that way. Being level 62 is probably also good help to reduce the incoming damage. After a couple of turns, the robot form is down again and we can focus back on baby Mitsuo. Luckily, he goes through an entire cycle of magic attacks again before trying to rebuild the robot. Unfortunately, I didn't notice that he went with electricity here and forgot to throw a magic mirror on Yosuke, resulting in him almost getting wiped and me panicking for just a moment. Once he starts rebuilding, we switch back to throwing Magatamas. Luckily, at this point he is pretty much done and with the last couple of Magatamas we get him down, win the fight and complete the dungeon. Back in the real world, we continue building social links and actually have to reject our first social link in Chie because I just can't get myself over doing the harem route because even though the cutscenes are usually rather funny, I just... I just can't, I'm sorry. <laughs> we also start out maxing the first social links, mainly the active party members as well as Psycho, since working in the hospital oftentimes is the only thing we can do during nighttime at this point. I did want to max out all social links of the active party, since they learned the evade passive spell to their elemental weakness on the last social link, and this is going to be very important considering the next boss can hit pretty much every weakness out there. We also ride the scooter again three more times until we discover Shichiri Beach. Unfortunately, we can't fish here yet since we need a new rod for that, but with the beach discovery, we also unlock new bugs that we can use to catch the Guardian and Samigawa. This one unlocks the new rod to fish at the beach. Isn't it convenient when stuff falls together perfectly like this? We also take the main party to the cinema again for an additional level and some extra stats. Ideally, you want to use rainy days for cinema since most social links aren't available on those. We go to the summer festival with our party, Teddy is weird as always, and we go there again the next day, but this time only with Risei. Sorry to say this Risei, but you'll be rejected later on as well, so don't try to make any moves on us. To continue on with storyline events, we go up to the beach next. We get a couple of more cutscenes and tell naked Kanji to let him dangle before he's doing his best impression of a mermaid. Yeah, I think that's enough for this part. We also continue the social link with Marie. Technically, she's the only one we need to max out to get the true golden ending, but her social link was locked at level 4 until Risa joined the party. Luckily, we still have a lot of time left, so that really shouldn't be an issue at all. At home, Nanako asks us if we can help her with her homework the next couple of days. Technically, you could decline here and free up the evening slot for the next days, but let's be real. We just cannot be that mean to the little Nanako, so of course being the good bro we are, we will help her out. This also has a nice side effect that we're getting additional social link points for the main party members, 
who also stopped by during those days, so we can skip out on having to hang out with them an additional time for some. At this point, we maxed out all our active party members other than Rise. I wanted to get her to at least rank 7 before the next dungeon for the random buff she can apply every once in a while. Just like Chie though, we reject Risa as well, which, to be honest, was less worse than I thought it would be, especially considering the game is trying to force Risa on you pretty much throughout the entire game's story. And because we didn't have enough story events yet, we also go to the fireworks festival of our party, as well as Nanako and Tojima. This also marks the return of Flat Teddy, probably my favorite character pick in the entire game. I mean, just look at that thing. We are also back in school, so we can finally complete the open quests we still had. Due to that, we can also do the shopping related stuff now. We go to the item shop on a rainy day to get a 20% discount and stack up on healing items. The antibiotic gel and the maca leaf each heal for 400 HP, so we stack up on those. Luckily at this point, we have slightly over 1 million yen, so money isn't really an issue at all. We also buy new weapons for the party. At Daidara, we get new weapons for Yosuke and Kanji. And in the pub, we get the beach parasol for main character, as well as the steel slippers for Chie. Another thing we can do now is go on bike trips with the party members. The more useful ones here are for Rise and Kanji. Going out with Rise increases the damage of all out attacks, which is a really nice bonus. Kanji learns fast healing on the last bike trip, which does sound nice, but considering party members often heal each other automatically and we have a lot of Amrita sodas, it's not really going to be worth it for the most part. Now to appears in a TV interview, and because that's how it always works, she shows up on the Midnight Channel shortly afterwards. After gaining a couple of hints about who Naoto is as a person, we have everything we need and are off into the TV again for the next dungeon section of the game. Before starting the next session, we quickly go to the Velvet Room again and do a couple of fusions. Since main character hit level 62, we can now fuse ourselves a Byako. This one has very similar stats compared to Tamlin. Even though it has lower endurance, it has way more agility. The more important thing though are its elemental affinities. It already gnaws electricity and light, drains ice and only has a fire weakness. It is one of very few personas in this game that already nullifies three elements from the get-go, while only having a single weakness at the same time, and is also a physical attacker based from the stats. Since we use Scotty as one of the ingredients, we can carry over repel fire, as well as null physical from Kingu. With that, Byako can only be damaged by wind, dark, and almighty, which is already a pretty good upgrade. Unfortunately, we can only carry over 4 skills in total, so one of the auto mass skills is going to be ditched for now. Luckily, we can make skill cards out of those, so we could technically learn that skill later at any given point. The only big disadvantage is that Byaku doesn't learn Endure. Endure can be acquired with a level 5 skill card, but unfortunately level 5 has a lot of different skill cards, so getting one of those can be quite the problem. Because of that, we also got ourselves a Ganesha, since Ganesha gets Endure as a cardable skill. Cardable? Is that even a word? Anyways, this serves as a backup in case we don't get the level 5 Endure card from the shuffle, in which case we can go to the cafe with Ganesha later and get the card out of it. As always, before entering the new dungeon, we pay a visit to the previous one in order to get all the necessary items for the currently open side quests. Since we don't actually have a lot of those, this time it is finished rather quickly. We go up to the top of Void Quest to again fight the optional boss there. Again the boss only does physical attacks, as well as an occasional Mudon. The party actually does pretty good amounts of damage, and the counters do reflect damage back at the boss more often than not. Because of that, it is down rather quickly, and this time the entire party is still alive by the end of it. The Gaia sword we get afterwards as reward, unfortunately, is slightly worse than the currently equipped beach parasol. It does have 6 more attack, but also 10% less hit rate, so it's not really worth switching. Again, the main reason we go for this fight in the first place is for the extra courage we get after completion. Once we're done with that, we make our way to the secret laboratory the next dungeon of the game. Again, there isn't really much that is worth mentioning here. 
This dungeon does have a little bit of backtracking due to the keycard mechanics, but it's not really anything bad. A good thing here is that the Golden Hand encounters sometimes like to enrage themselves by using Ball Sack. This not only raises their attack, but also makes it much easier to defeat them since they take quite a bit more damage than they usually would, which makes for easier leveling. Not that we're on the overlevel to begin with, but we'll take the experience and the money from those fights. The mid dungeon boss fight again is pretty much a pushover. The only thing it does is power charge followed up by an AoE physical attack. So every other turn we switch over to Rangler to reflect the damage back while auto attacking. Towards the end of the fight the boss is about to explode, which wouldn't be a problem since the entire party has endure on it thanks to the maxed out social links. Because of the party's good damage we don't even get to see that though and the boss goes down before the almighty explosion happens. With that we continue on in the dungeon until we reach the bottom floor. We did have to grind the last two floors a couple of times in order to get the necessary materials that are needed for equipment upgrades after this dungeon, but luckily that didn't take too long. Because of that we also ran into more golden hands on the way and gained a couple of levels during that. Once we reach the bottom floor our Byaku is already standing at level 82 with the party having level 76 to 77. For comparison Naoda herself joins the party at level 55, so you can probably tell that I am a bit ahead of levels to where you're supposed to be here. This also translated over pretty much into the actual boss battle. Naoda uses element zero to nullify all elemental resistances before attacking with AoE elemental spells. This was the reason why we got all our party members skill rank maxed out to gain access to the evade spells in order to avoid being attacked twice each turn. Even though that only worked a couple of times, it was still useful. The incoming damage from AoE attacks, even when hitting weaknesses, wasn't really that big of a deal. The more annoying part here was the dizziness inflicted after two weakness hits in a row. Galgalim Ice was annoying since it put a party member at 1 HP, but this was healed rather easily as well. During later phases, Naoto likes to use Heat Riser after hitting a weakness. Luckily, we have purifying waters to negate that effect before it might become dangerous. And yeah, this is pretty much everything to talk about in that battle. By knowing those patterns, we can just rinse and repeat until Naoto is out of HP and the battle is won. Naoto is saved, we leave the TUUL for now and come home where Adachi is getting drunk while Daddy Dojima is getting tired of his stuff. If only you knew what is going to happen soon. Again, we continue building our social links, especially focusing on Marie at this point. We also go on a scooter date with Riese a couple of more times to boost our all out attack damage. Since we didn't get lucky in terms of getting an endure skill card in the dungeon, we use our backup plan and go back to the cafe in order to extract the card out of Ganesha. Teaching endure to Biako also means that we can upgrade it to enduring soul with a skill upgrade card from a shuffle during the next dungeon segment. We also visit Daidara again in order to upgrade our equipment we unlocked with the materials that we grinded in the laboratory. Once October hits, there is also a new movie available to watch, so again we drag our main party to the cinema in order to get a free level up as well as some other bonus stats. After a while Naoto recovers and joins the party. Now Naoto would be a nice addition to the party since unlike everybody else she doesn't have any elemental weaknesses. Unfortunately her stats are pretty bad compared to the others and she doesn't learn a single passive ability so just like Yukiko and Teddy she is going to be benched for the rest of the game. With that out of the way we continue through the game's story and again I'll try to make this one rather short. The party goes to the hospital to get Teddy checked only to find out that they don't find out anything about him. They start a band for an event at Jeunesse. The guys try to go crowd surfing and even though two out of three face planted rather hard, they still did a better job than Shio in Persona 5 did. At home we get a warning letter telling us not to rescue anyone anymore. Things are finally picking up here. Or maybe not because there is still the school festival coming up as well. Now I'd rather skip this part here because the entire school festival is a huge cringe fest, starting out with the date cafe, the dress up drag contest and the beauty pageant. This is usually where I say stuff like those things didn't age well but I don't think that one was ever funny to begin with. 
There is also the segment with the hot springs at the Amagi in which at least gave us a fun little exchange with the guys being hit by thousands of buckets. We'll just ignore everything that followed afterwards. November already hit, which means there is a new movie at the cinema. At this point, I think you all know the drill. Daddy Duchima gets home with a warning letter addressed to Mr. Tyson Mike. Obviously, he's not very happy with the letter's message, since he doesn't believe what we tell him about personas and the mystical magic TV. He's taking us to the police station in order to get sober again. Nanako shows up on the Midnight Channel, everybody panics, and the girls rush to the house only to find that nobody is there and Nanako's gone. Dojima crashes his car trying to get to Namatami, who is on the escape and gets injured badly. We promise Daddy Dojima that we'll make sure to rescue Nanako and that everything will be fine. Now, I did want to go to the cinema with Kanji before entering the next dungeon section. Unfortunately though, that is not possible as long as Nanako hasn't been rescued yet, which is... Kinda understandable, but annoying at the same time, because all the other party members were at the same level, and now Kanji is gonna be a level behind. Really, not a big issue, but it did irk me just so slightly. The dungeon section itself started off like pretty much every other one before it. First of all, we go back into the previous one to get the necessary items for the quests we haven't finished yet. Unlike the other dungeons before that though, this time, we're not going to defeat the optional boss on the bottom floor. The weapon we would get here for Naoto is useless since she won't be used at all, and the extra courage we would get, which was the main reason why we ever did that to begin with, isn't necessary anymore since we already maxed out courage earlier. So once we collected all necessary quest items, we're off into the next dungeon. The mid dungeon boss on floor 7 isn't really worth mentioning. Unlike past ones, this one actually uses magic attacks exclusively, usually after doing mind charge first. I was thinking of potentially cheesing this one with magic mirrors, but the damage still isn't a big problem and the boss is already down before even having a chance at doing a second attack, so nothing really to worry about. With that, we continue on through the dungeon until we made it all the way up. Before going to the boss fight though, I wanted to try something out. I did mention during the playthrough that I wanted to give the Reaper a shot a couple of times, and I thought that I'd probably need to be in the mid 80s to somewhat have a chance. Seeing as the party's average level at this point was 85, I wanted to try just to see how far we can make it in the Reaper fight. To get the Reaper to spawn, we will do what's commonly known as the Yukiko Castle method. The way the Reaper spawn works in Persona 4 is once you open up 21 normal chests, you start hearing chains rattling in the background. The 22nd chance then has a random chance to spawn the Reaper and is easily identified by the message that pops up when trying to open up a chest. If the 22nd chest does not contain the Reaper or the player switches floors after opening the 21st chest, the counter will reset again, which means the last two chests need to be opened up on the same floor. So what we're going to do here is we're going to open 20 chests, then enter the 5th floor in Yukiko's castle, use a go home and make a save file. As you might remember, floors with mid dungeon bosses always have a fixed layout. We used that early in the run for golden hands manipulation and we can now use that for the reaper as well. Floor 5 of the castle just so happens to have exactly two chests in it, which is pretty much perfect for this. So we go into this floor, open up the first chest, get the rattling chain sound, and then open up the second chest to hopefully spawn the reaper. If the chest contains a normal item, you can just reload the save and try again until it works. Now to the actual reaper fight itself. The reaper gets two attacks each turn and the fight itself has three different phases. In phase 1 the reaper will mostly use elemental breaks and try to exploit elemental weaknesses to get an additional turn along with a single target insta kill spell every now and then. With all party members at max social rank, the evade skills kick in quite often which is definitely a big help. Since we don't have any means to debuff the enemy, the most important thing here is keeping up a defense buff with a diamond shield at all times to reduce the incoming damage quite a bit. In phase 2, the reaper will focus on insta-killing your party, this time with the AoE versions Mahamoan and Mamudon. Luckily, we harvested a couple of eggplants and also gotten a few homunculus on the way which prevent the party member from being insta-killed. 
Reset will also protect the party from an AoE insta-kill attack once. In Phase 3, the Reaper additionally will also gain the Almighty skills Megidola and Megidolao, while also still trying to get his insta-kill spells in again every once in a while. With the help of Diamond Shields, the damage is manageable, but if the Reaper does make the Lound twice in a turn, it can become very dangerous pretty quickly. Going in, I was pretty certain that this would not be doable without using all my resources. Throughout the fight though, it became pretty clear that this was not as hard as I thought it would be. The damage was manageable. Even the occasional weakness hit every now and then was fine for the most part. The most annoying thing were the amount of insta-kill attacks. The Reaper has gone through all my protection items rather quickly, and after triggering Endure, the party members went down to those more than anything else. The main character luckily has immunity to light, and also Enduring Soul, so killing him off is pretty hard compared to the rest of the party. Once the Reaper went down, we get our reward for the fight. Now, this Despite what some internet sites say, it is actually random whether you get a weapon, armor or accessory first. While the godly robe obviously is a very good armor, we're mostly looking for the ultimate weapons for the party and the main reasons for that might not be what you think at first. Even though the ultimate weapons have very strong attack stats and for the most part nice bonuses, the main reason for me getting those would be so I don't have to grind materials in every dungeon in order to unlock new weapons, needing a certain amount of materials for new stuff, and having to grind shadows for that became rather annoying quickly so this entire thing would be more a quality of life thing for me than anything else. And of course, as you might have guessed already, I got a godly robe on the first attempt. So I reloaded the save, did the fight again, and lo and behold. I got another godly robe. At this point I was questioning whether or not this is even worth it, especially as the reaper has pretty much decimated my entire stock of insta-kill protection in a single fight. At this point I did want to get at least one ultimate weapon though, so again the save was reloaded, the fight was done again, and third time's the charm, seeing as we got the first ultimate weapon for main character. At this point, I really didn't want to stop anymore, so I decided we're gonna get all weapons for the main party. So we're back to square one with opening 20 chests first. I did go to floor 7 in the castle for that, because diamond shields actually have a decent chance of spawning there, and I do need a couple of them every time I'm going through the reaper fight. So basically, rinse and repeat for the second weapon, the third weapon, and the fourth weapon. Luckily I got all of them after each other without another godly rope in between, so it didn't take me as long as I first was afraid it would. Now with our newly overpowered weapons we can finish off the actual dungeon part as we head back into the heaven to rescue Nanako. The confrontation with Namatame doesn't go as planned and Namatame transforms into Kuni no Sagiri starting the next boss battle and technically the first battle against the god. Again, this is a battle that has several different phases as you cut down his HP. In phase 1, he mostly throws out single target magic attacks that don't really do that big of a damage. Because of that, I decided against using diamond shields once the initial defense buff were off, which almost cost me afterwards. Once we reach phase 2, he uses quad converge, which greatly increases the damage of a single element while significantly weakening all others. Luckily, Physical damage is not affected by this, so we can just continue doing normal damage. What I didn't think of though is that Quad Converge also greatly increases Kuni no Sagiri's damage, which almost resulted in me getting wiped due to a double Mirage Dine that put everybody but Yosuke at 1 HP. Luckily, the entire party has Endure, with main character getting a full heal due to Enduring Soul. This was a wake up call to not take that battle too lightly and make sure to keep my defense buffs up at all times. Awaiting weakness hits here is rather important since the boss usually only gets one attack per turn unless he hits a weakness. With the weight skills, thanks to the social links, combined with an extra weight from the accessory, this actually works rather well for the most part. Once you hit phase 3, Kuni no Sagiri will take control of your party members. Even though this is mostly random as far as I know, I got rather unlucky as he took control of my entire party. Luckily they only use physical attacks which we know, so it's not really a big issue for the most part. During the last phase he starts spamming Unerring Justice which is an AoE almighty attack. 
as long as we have diamond shields up. Again, the damage is manageable for the most part. My favorite part of this battle was actually the last turn where Kunino Sekiri used Archidine at main character, which reflected back and actually killed him in the process. Well, guess he wanted to go out on his own terms. Back in the real world, Nanako is admitted to the hospital, where Dojima is still being treated as well, and we continue on with our normal life, now having the entire place for ourselves in the meantime. We make sure to max out Marie's social links, as well as visit the cinema with Kanji, since we didn't have enough time to take the entire party there before the dungeon session started. We also did some more gardening to plant more eggplants, since the Reaper basically went through our entire stock of insta-death protection, and I did want to have a couple of those available for the next upcoming dungeons. Now, there isn't anything special happening in the meantime, so we'll just skip forward to the next story-related happenings. The fog gets thicker every single day, until Kanji notices that the glasses from the TV world actually help here. Unfortunately, this is not the only bad thing happening though, as Nanako's condition is getting worse every hour until... Admittedly, during my first playthrough of this game, this one really caught me off guard as I did not see that happening at all. I literally thought I somehow already ran into a bad ending here since I couldn't think this was supposed to happen. Dojima is on the way to Namatami's room to take matters into his own hands, but gets stopped by the police in front of the room. This conveniently gives us the chance to sneak in Namatami's room without anyone noticing. Now, the next couple of answers are going to determine whether you get a bad ending or you're on the road to the true ending. Even though you have to get a couple of answers correctly to stay on track, it's not really that hard. The party actually asks you if you're sure when you choose the wrong option, so once we're done calming the party down, we're on way to the actual victory. This also means that Nanako comes back to life, and Teddy eventually returns to the party again later on. The next day, we talk to Namatami again, ask him a couple of questions, and it becomes clear that he is in fact not the killer that we are looking for, so it's back to square one and trying to figure out who the real perpetrator is. We meet up at Aya in the evening to go through everything one more time, and after stepping outside to get a clear head, we finally find out who the real killer is. Admittedly, there are a couple of hilarious options in there, including Nanako, the two dead victims, the dead teacher, or even Hanako and Kashiwagi. Realistically, Adachi is the only logical choice at this point, and if you manage to get Adachi's confidence to the highest possible level at this point, you actually get the choice to protect him and not tell your party members. If you haven't seen that ending, go look it up, but obviously not before finishing watching this video, of course. We stop Adachi at the hospital, and he gets busted for being the true perpetrator. After chasing him through the hospital, we end up in Namatami's room with nobody there, so naturally, there is only one way he could have gone. Teddy returns to the party, and together we find Adachi's location within the TV world. After a nice conversation with the now completely gone nuts Adachi, the path to the next dungeon is open. From December 8th on, you could already enter the TV and complete the dungeon. If you do so though, unlike in every other dungeon, the time will fast forward all the way to December the 24th. So this is the only time in the game where you want to complete the dungeon as late as somewhat possible, in order to maximize your free time. So again, we do a couple of more social links during the last bits of free time that we got before entering the TV to finally take down the murderer once and for all. As always, before starting the new dungeon though, we're going to go back into the previous one first to complete the quests we have gotten in the meantime. Once that is done, we start with Magatsu Inaba. Now one thing that I quickly noticed here is the amount of enemies that we cannot damage with physical attacks. A lot of enemies either nullify, repel or straight up absorb physical attacks. We did stock up on elemental items before, so technically we could go through all of them, but I don't really need the experience at this point, and I'd rather have a few items in backup in case of an emergency or something. Floor 3 of Mandala World is somewhat special. A few of you might remember that the gimmick of this floor is to not fight any shadows, or Adachi is going to kick you out of the dungeon completely. 
Well, the first time I got greedy and fought a golden hand because for some reason I thought I'd only have to redo this one floor and not the entire thing. And on the second try, I forgot that chests can contain enemies as well and got kicked out yet again. Third time's the charm, this time we made it through and our reward is the first mid dungeon boss. This one isn't really a big problem in terms of incoming damage, but more so because it constantly summons new enemies into battle, which can summon even more enemies. So ideally you try to beat all of them in the same turn. This did not quite work out like I was hoping for, but luckily due to the low amount of incoming damage, it still wasn't really a big issue for the most part. Again, we continue on until we reach the bottom floor, where we fight the second mid dungeon boss the very patriotic Austrian tower. The fight itself isn't that big of a deal. The enemy can only be hurt with physical and almighty attacks, which is no problem for us. The boss pretty much only spams make it allowance, so you're good to go as long as you keep your HP in check. The high counter is annoying, but nothing really to worry about, and after a couple of turns, the boss is already done, and we're almost done with this dungeon. Before going for a dachi though, we go back into the velvet room again to fuse a Horus. On level 73, Horus learns Absorb Wind as a cardable skill. Byaku still has a slot open and Adachi is going to be the last enemy in this game that is going to use dark spells, so I thought I'd rather take the wind immunity over the dark immunity. Another thing I'd like to mention is we're getting another specific accessory before going in, which is the Divine Pillar. Now, the Divine Pillar halves all the damage taken in exchange for not being able to dodge attacks anymore. This item is usually a rather rare drop from a golden chest, but luckily we can manipulate the drop again. So the way this works is we go to floor 6, use a go home and save, quit the game, reload, enter floor 6, reload the same file, enter floor 6 again, and the first chest to spawn will be a golden chest containing the divine pillar. This is probably the easiest manipulation in the entire game, so if anybody wants to try it out themselves, feel free to, it's really not hard. Now, I am not going to equip the divine pillar since the incoming damage should be fine for the most part due to the high levels the party has. It is more going to be an emergency anchor from this point on forward, just in case we might need it. So, for the Adachi fight, we're pretty much set here. The party has level 95, with main character being 94, so we're pretty close to maxing out already. Byaku has level 94 as well, with strength and agility already maxed out at 99. Otosu Kakaja will be replaced with Drain Wind once we're done here, and can go to the cafe to get the card out of Horus. We have a nice chit chat with Adachi who doesn't really like to listen to our words before turning into gloomy blue and attacking us. Adachi always starts the battle using Heat Riser. Luckily with purifying water we don't have to worry about that. Now generally the party does very low damage with their attacks, but luckily Adachi doesn't have that many HP either. Generally this fight is manageable for the most part. The incoming damage is not that big of a deal. I even stopped throwing up diamond shields for a boost since I didn't have that many and wanted to save them for the other upcoming fights. As mentioned earlier, Adachi is also the last boss to use Mudon, but luckily we planted a couple of eggplants so we can take the hits without problems. The AoE Evil Smile can be pretty nasty if you don't immediately heal it afterwards, since he will always follow it up with an insta-kill spell that will target every character inflicted with fear. Luckily, we have enough Amrita Sodas, as well as Risa, who is to heal ailments for the entire party at times as well. After a while, Adachi is down, phase 1 is over, and Adachi transforms into a big disco eyeball, also known as Amino Sagiri. Now, we also get to listen to the, in my opinion, best battle theme in the entire game. Compared to the Adachi fight, we actually do decent amounts of damage with our physical attacks here. Amino Sagiri gets to attack twice each turn and often tries to exploit elemental weaknesses against the party to follow it up. Luckily, the evade skill kicks in quite often, preventing Amino Sagiri to get another turn in. The boss also has quite a few almighty attacks in store, so sometimes you get attacked by two almighty spells in a single turn, which is pretty much the only thing that can actually hurt quite a bit even with diamond shields up. 
Once you get Amino Sekiri's health down to roughly 50%, it will start using Bewilder and Fog. In this state, you cannot do anything to the boss at all. No damage, no debuffs, nothing. You have two turns to prepare for a big strike, as Amino Sekiri will mind charge and also buff itself in the meantime. The first time I didn't guard the attack, which did pretty big damage to the entire party. Otherwise, the fight was going really good for the most part until this happened. Persona 4 Golden in general is a pretty decent port for the most part, but it does have a chance, all by very low, to crash at any given time. It does happen rather rarely, but when it does, it's usually at the worst possible time. So, unfortunately, restart the game, do the same thing over again. So, go through the entire cutscene, do the Adachi fight again, watch the transformation, and then Amino Sagiri Part 2. At least, we get to listen to some more of the battle theme, I guess. So, where did we stop? Oh yeah, right, the Vildering Fog. Anyways, make sure you guard the big attack, because it does a lot of damage, even at the level that we are here at the moment. Once you roughly depleted 75% of the boss's health, Amino Sagiri will always check for party buffs and nullify them using the Kaja. Now, while that does cause it to waste one of the two turns, it is going to burn through our diamond shields very quickly at this rate, so I decided to not buff anymore and get the fight done with as fast as possible. Another new addition at this point is Quake, another AoE almighty attack that can also knock your party members down. When the boss does Quake turn 1, it usually follows it up with another Bewildering Fog. Still, this is nothing we haven't seen until now, so as long as we prepare properly and heal after every attack, there isn't much to worry about. At this point, we're pretty much done with the battle, and after a few more attacks, Amino Sekiri is down. We head Adachi over to the police, and the world is saved. That's what one would think if there weren't like two and a half months still left in the game. Since we rejected all girls leading up to this, we'll spend Christmas Eve with our manly friends for a good old sausage fest. Kanji even brought a present, as well as the Macho Metal accessory. This one has physical damage, which is not bad, but in this scenario not really useful anymore. Again, I'm trying to keep the cutscene related stuff short, since this is getting pretty long already. The party celebrates New Year's together, we build a teddy man with Nanako, and Marie has gone missing, so we ask Margaret to go look for her. This gives us some more free time to actually max out a couple of social links that we wouldn't have done otherwise like Naoki. Another important thing here is to get the third awakening with all the party members. This does change up a couple of elemental affinities. Unfortunately, it doesn't erase the weakness, but they now null another element while absorbing the first one. We also go to the cafe one more time in order to extract the Absorb Wind card from Horus. Putting that on Byaku means that it's now immune to all elements but Dark. This pretty much completes our persona with the three Automa skills, Enduring Soul, High Counter, Null Physical, Repel Fire and Absorb Wind. There is also a new movie available at the cinema, so once again we drag all our active party member in there for the extra level as well as the bonus stats for both January and February. At this point, the party members are already level 97, so we're already almost maxed out here. The skiing event approaches, and once we're actually done with all the cutscenes here, the party ends up in an old hut. The party gets dragged into the old TV, and we end up in Hollow Forest, with Margaret explaining that Marie has shut herself in here, so obviously we try to rescue her. Now, this was the dungeon that I was probably most afraid of. Now, for everybody who never played through this one, let me quickly explain. In the Hollow Forest, the game takes away all your items and equipment and replaces it with very basic stuff. After every battle, your SP are halved, while your accessory makes you regenerate a bit of SP after every turn. So, as you might be able to tell, the entire dungeon is basically built around you using magic attacks to progress through something we're not allowed to do. This becomes even more obvious as we approach the boss, but more on that in a few. Luckily, most of the random encounters can still be damaged with physical attacks. Some of them only take very little damage though. The equipment found in chests usually revolves around resisting a specific element. 
The first mid-dungeon boss on floor 4 isn't that big of a deal, but more annoying than anything else. Even though it is weak to physical attacks, it barely takes any damage and keeps summoning adds to the battle. So ideally you eliminate all those and then try to hit an all out attack on the boss in order to get some good damage in. The rest isn't really anything special, just rinse and repeat until the boss is dead. Golden chests on higher floors potentially have a chance to drop armor that repels an element. We try to get the correct ones here on each party member in order to eliminate their weakness and also for some repel damage. Floor 6 is the next special one. There are two kinds of enemies here, namely the Stone Panzer and the Lawless Fuss. The reason why I mentioned those specifically is that those shadows can drop the Taku items, which deal a fixed 150 damage of a specific element to an enemy. We're going to need a lot of those for phase 2 of the upcoming boss fight, so we're actually farming here for quite a while in order to get a good amount. Before we continue on though, we go back to the Velvet Room one more time. We're going to fuse a Metatron here for a very specific reason. Metatron from level 87 to 89 learns Repel Fire, Ice and Electricity. Since we also get to carry over Repel Physical as well as Null Dark, Metatron can only be damaged with Almighty attacks and repels everything but Dark attacks. Again, this is going to come in very handy for the next boss fight. Floor 7 has the next mid dungeon boss waiting on us. This one nulls every element but Almighty and resists physical attacks. Unfortunately, it also has high counter, which is rather annoying. Technically, high counter has a 20% chance to trigger, but at times it triggered like 3 out of 4 times each turn. So either there are probably other factors playing into this, or I just got incredibly unlucky. Luckily, the boss itself doesn't really do a lot of damage, so after getting a crap ton of high counters, it did go down eventually. The rest of the dungeon isn't really worth mentioning for the most part, even more so since we're almost done at this point anyways. Once we got to the top, we accumulated roughly 60 Dotakus, with the party members already capping out at level 99. Once on top, we run into Marie who tells us to leave. We don't do like she told us, and therefore the next battle begins. Marie, again, is a fight that comes in two phases. In phase 1, she repels physical attacks with alienation wall, but can be damaged with elemental damage, so we use the first couple of Dotakus against her. After throwing 8 Dotakus, Marie casts Shell of Denial, which pretty much signals the end of phase 1. We guard until the cutscene happens, Marie transforms into Kuzumi no Okami, and the actual boss fight begins. Kusumi no Okami repels literally everything. The only way to damage her is using the elemental break items we got on the way here to break the immunities. This is also the reason why we've used Metatron earlier. Kusumi no Okami occasionally can use all kinds of elemental spells. So we are using a break of each element and hope to reflect some of the damage back at her. This is also the reason why we farmed so many Takus earlier, since they are literally the only way we can actively damage her. So basically every third turn we throw a break of each element while throwing the Takus and healing items in between and hoping for some reflected damage. A repel deals over 400 damage to her, which is pretty big considering that the Takus only do 150. Unfortunately, she mostly uses almighty attacks and some of those, especially in later phases, actually deal a pretty decent amount of damage. Due to all our items being gone, we don't have access to diamond shields in order to buff our defense, which makes things a little harder as well. The fact that we only have life stones to heal our HP doesn't make things any easier either. Every couple of turns, she also uses Draining Fog, which drains SP of the party and at the same time also damages herself, so this is a nice added bonus considering the SP we have are pretty much useless anyways. Another annoying move is Enclosure Shell, which nullifies all damage it takes until she opens up the cape again. Those turns are mostly used to prolong the elemental breaks and or heal up the party. So basically we're chugging elemental breaks, while throwing the Takus and healing items in between to keep the party alive. Towards the end, it actually got pretty close a couple of times because her damage output was getting pretty big due to me not being able to buff my defense, and the lack of AoE healing made it harder to recover. Shoutouts to Risa for healing my party and getting them back up when the boss got everybody but main character dizzy during her turn. If it wasn't for this, that could have turned out really ugly. 
Eventually, Kusumi no Ukami went down as well, Marie saved, and we all returned to the real world. Back at home again, Valentine's Day is coming up, and since we rejected all the girls, we are having another sausage fest with the guys at Chines. Main character passes out with Nanako's chocolate, and the game's fasting forward to March and the last day before leaving town. We go to say goodbye to all our maxed out social links, which is pretty much everybody but Yukiko, Naoto and the Fox. Unfortunately, there wasn't just enough time for all of them. The game tells us to go home, but we know better and return to Chines. The party gets together one more time and we get a letter from Adachi, which makes the entire party question how this entire thing even started to begin with. We go talk to Dojima and Nanako again about the first day arriving and Nanako actually mentions something about the gas station at the weird attendee there. We go to the velvet room to get the orb of sight and go talk to the gas station attendant. The attendant gets identified as Izanami and we are off into the actual final dungeon, this time for real. Now, there really isn't anything to say about the dungeon itself. After two floors, I straight up stopped fighting enemies because there was literally no reason to do so anymore. The party, as well as my main persona, were already maxed out. I had all the skills I wanted, so we just skipped all of that. Same goes for the chests. We only open up golden chests in hope to get some late game armor upgrades maybe, but unfortunately to no avail. The first mid dungeon boss was pretty much free. It actually slipped on its first two attacks, allowing me to get free damage in with the all out attack. Other than that, it was pretty much down within three turns. Mid dungeon boss number two wasn't that big of an issue either. The more annoying thing about this one was the constant spam of Mahamoan, resulting in me losing quite a few eggplants. Phase 1 Izanami can actually do Hamoan, which main character nulls, but I'd still like to keep a few of those for the rest of the party. With that being said, once we reach the final floor, we encounter Izanami and the final battle of this challenge begins. Unsurprisingly, again, this is a fight that comes in two phases. One thing I immediately noticed was how I was not doing a lot of damage in phase 1 with my regular physical attacks. Izanami herself has a wide area of attacks, ranging from elemental AoE spells to almighty to status elements. Luckily, in phase 1 she only gets to attack once per turn, so the damage output is pretty manageable for the most part, as long as the defense buff is kept up. Since physical attacks weren't doing that much damage, I decided to throw all my lightning magatamas at her. Those do 150 fixed damage, and since phase 2 absorbs electricity, I can just safely throw all of them at her here. I could have also thrown a couple of magic mirrors here to reflect some of the elemental damage back, but I didn't even think of this idea first. Luckily, it still wasn't that big of a deal. Once the lightning magatamas were gone, we switched back to regular attacks. Similar to Kunino Sagiri, Izanami in her first phase actually killed herself when the Mara Jedine that reflected back from main character actually got her HP to zero. Afterwards, it's just guarding through the next couple of turns before we pull out the Orb of Sight and phase 2 of the boss fight begins. Izanami transforms into Izanami no Okami and we enter the last fight of the game. Unlike in the first phase, this one actually gets to attack twice per turn, so you need to watch the incoming damage. Luckily, unlike in the Hall of Forest, we do have access to Maka Leaves here, which take up a big chunk of the healing. Physical attacks, again, don't really do a lot of damage, so we're back to throwing the last couple of Magatamas we have, while also healing up and buffing in between. The best kind of damage output does come from Reflects though. Izanami will occasionally use Power Charge, followed up by Agniestra. When she power charges, we throw physical mirrors on the party, as well as change to Metatron on main character for repel physical. This does between 220 and 230 damage times 4 reflected back at her, so about roughly 900 damage in total, which is way more than what I can do with attacks or items. We only do this with physical mirrors though, because even though Izanami has all kinds of elemental attacks as well, she actually drains electricity like mentioned before. So, if I get unlucky and she throws out a Maziodine, she heals herself for roughly a thousand HP and this is something I definitely did not want to see happen. Once the Magatamas are gone, we switch over to Smart Bombs. Luckily, we still have a few of those as well. 
Unlike Magatamas, those only do 100 damage, but it's still more than what we do with unbuffed physical attacks. Rise will occasionally buff the party's attack. In this situation, we switch back to physical attacks since those also do 80 to 90 damage with the attack buff in order to maximize our damage and not run out of smart bombs too quickly. Status ailments are quickly taken care of with Amrita Solos because if you don't, Izanami will use summons to Yomi which insta-kill all characters inflicted with any status ailment. This is pretty much everything to this fight. With all those things in mind, we continue throwing the last couple of smart bombs and keep the party alive until Izanami starts doing thousand curses. At this point, it's pretty much GG. We go through the scripted turns until everybody gets taken down, all maxed out social links appear before us in order to help us get back to our feet, Mike Tyson reappears in battle, and to finish it off, we actually have to use Myriad Truths. Yes, I know, this is technically considered a skill. But that's also the reason why the rules say skills may only be used in order to advance the story. This is literally the only time in the entire game where you are required to use a specific skill to continue. And since it's basically a scripted event, and we technically beat the boss already, I think we can all agree that this is okay. With that being said, Izanami is defeated, the world is saved, and this time, it is actually over. The next day, the party sees main character off at the train station, as well as the maxed out social links from school. The train takes off, main character is gone, and the game is finished. Oh wait, there is also the golden exclusive app lock a couple of months later. Namatame becomes a politician and runs for mayor. We get a surprise welcome back party and Jeunesse, Kanji did... Well... This... Well, Yukiko somehow managed to age roughly 30 years within a few months. Guess that's the price you have to pay when you have to run an inn. We celebrate at home with the party, Dojima and Nanako. Marie became the weather girl and that is the actual end of the game. Now, before we end this video here, I would like to say a couple of things. This challenge was actually more fun than I thought at first. Juggling around different personas, trying to maximize the amount of passive skills, and all of that gave the challenge quite some variety. Even though it did become a little easier compared to the beginning once the game started to open up a bit in terms of possible skill combinations, it was still quite challenging at times, especially when you get put into a dungeon and the game pretty much takes away everything you had before. And also, of course, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, activate the notifications to stay updated. I will definitely do more challenge runs like this in the future for sure. Also make sure to follow me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Ragnaralver, where I stream all of my challenges live, and follow me on Twitter, all the links are also below the video. With that being said, that is it for me this time, thank you very much for watching, take care, and I hope I see all of you next time as well.